Hello everyone, welcome to Old Bluff. I thought I'd do a video today. Uh, it's going to be a production, just kind of a standard production run that I do a lot here. Uh, customers brought 30 logs or so. Uh, it, we're cutting up in various different sizes, 6x6s, 8x8s, 2x10s, 6s and 8s. But I, I'm going to be talking about it along in the video of what's going on. But I wanted to talk about a few items that I have thought of to discuss in videos over the uh, past few months that kind of stick out in my mind. Now, a lot of you sawmillers that are out there, you're going to know about this stuff, but some of the guys that are just starting out are thinking about getting into it. Um, these are some things that they might want to know and think about. And number one is talking to customers. Now, what I do, probably 75, 80% of what I do is I cut logs for people. They'll bring the logs to me and tell, they'll tell me what they want and we'll go over everything. Um, to see what's needed. Now, in doing that, you have to find out what kind of logs they've got, what kind of trees, what's the diameter of them, the length of them, what they're actually wanting to cut out of the logs. So in talking to a customer on the phone, one of the first things I ask them is, what are the average diameters of the logs? You know, and it's easy for a person to say, oh, gosh, we got big, huge, beautiful trees, and that's fine. But you got to get down to the meat on the bone here with this, and you, you need to know what the small diameters on the logs are, because that's all you've got to work with. Um, so, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that, and that'll get that in their mind of what to look for on the logs, and just an average of what they've got, like this last customer that you're going to be seeing me cut their logs, um, they had 30 logs, and they're probably average eh, 14, 16 inches. Well, that's kind of what you need to know if they start asking, what do you charge or whatever. And that's another issue in talking with a customer. I, I do not do board foot pricing myself. I only do by the hour. That way, if you're doing one buys, two buys, four by fours, just whatever they need, it's all contained in there. Uh, you get into board foot prices, you know, it just varies up to the size of the tree. How long it takes you to get whatever they're needing out of that tree is going to change if they want four by fours or one buys. So it's just simpler for me to stay with a. Uh, hourly price for what I do. So through the video we're going to be talking about some of the little things that I do and sizing the log up when I look at it to see what I can get out of it. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, drying of your wood. I've watched some really good videos here lately and I'm going to leave a link in the description. If you've not heard of Shelter Institute and it's Pat Hennon is the gentleman's name. It's very helpful videos this gentleman's got out there. He talks about his timber framing versus conventional homes, um, you know, what's done in drying wood, that's kiln drying or air drying. It's very important, I think, for a sawmiller to know and understand the differences. And, you know, what to use, say, on the end of your log. I, I've always used a paste wax on my logs, what I use, everybody uses different things. I know anchor seal is a big thing. It's so expensive. And all you need is something that'll work, um, basically. Uh, you could paint them if you wanted to. But, you know, this paint's not quite as good as something a little thicker. But anyway, um, I think it would be in everybody's benefit if you're sawmilling to look at the videos that um, Shelter Institute has out there. So anyway, I want to get started on this, and I'll be talking about different things along the way through the video, and I'll also comment on what's going on in the video as well. So let's get started on this. Now this customer brought to me 
um, like say 30 logs or so and you can see here on the ends of them that I've labeled what I think I can cut out of these logs six by six eight by eight this on and on well I always when I look at the log the end of the log I'll automatically deduct four inches and so that's going to tell me what I can possibly get out of that log is a can but then you need to look at taper and if there's any um, sway in the log any sweep um, because all that plays into it if you push it up to that limit you're going to probably have a good bit of weighing on the edges of your finished lumber and that's something you don't necessarily want so you know in thinking about these things it lets you know just looking at that small end what you're going to be able to get out of the log and I've said this in other videos I always put that small end towards the operator end that's the business end of the log that's all you can get out of the log you might as well be looking at it and have your saw blade at it so that you can line up for what you need and you know in lining up a lot of these um, cuts that you're going to make for the flitches I try and gauge with my laser light say if I'm needing an 8 inch board I look at that laser line on the end of the log and look at it and make sure that it's 8 inches if it's not I know I'm going to have a lot of weighing on the finished lumber so I keep that in mind when I'm looking at it and these little things you know you learn over time but you know, I wanted to discuss these things and uh, let you guys think about it in your own situation. Um, you know, it's very helpful and it just speeds things up. And like me labeling these logs on the end, I did that with the uh, lumber crayon as I was checking them with a metal detector for metal. Now, you'll see in this video, I miss one. A small piece of barbed wire is in the middle of the tree and you'll see it crash here shortly I think it's on this particular log but um, you know by labeling the end of the log when they have 25 or 30 logs when and I throw it up on the mill I've already determined what I can get out of it so at that point I'm just setting the pith on the log making my cut looking at that laser line knowing if I need a six by six I might get one out two out whatever the log can yield, uh, I'll know that right away. Um, and it really helps to speed things up. I mean, in just marking those, it only takes a few seconds to measure that tree, and I know by deducting the four inches what I'm going to get out. Now, here in the video, you'll see that I'm going to have, uh, you'll see, I think, some dust fly up here. There it went right there. I just hit the metal. And, man, this was so frustrating. And this was the first log. Here, I'm pulling my hair out. First log I threw up there, and I don't know how I missed the bob wire that's in there is what we find out. So I had to, it took 30 minutes or maybe a little bit longer to get that flitch section trimmed off, out of the way, to get the sawmill off. And it really messed the blade up. Matter of fact, the blade would not back out. It had offset the teeth so much. Uh, it was pulling it off the sawmill, but I just kept wrestling with it and wrestling with it. I think I had to cut it twice just to get it off, and it's a real good way to start your morning off, but you just never know. You know, these things happen. Um, it's just part of sawmilling. Everybody out there that's sawmilled for a while has run across this or even worse, um, but you'll see I've cut that flitch section off and going to get it out of the way. I'm going to try and back the mill off, but it won't come off because of what it has done to the teeth on it. So I'll have to cut a little bit more off and pry it up enough to get the bandsaw blade out of it. It's very frustrating, but it's just one of those things, you know, to keep going. You just got to grit your teeth and go at it. You, know, you get logs that come from customers and you know I asked them if it's a yard tree or if it's near a fence line 
and you get all kinds of answers. Uh, most people just really don't know. They've either just bought the property or just clearing it, whatever. They really don't know enough. You know, I always look at the ends of the log to see if there's any staining. I know you guys are familiar with that, but I didn't see any on any of them. And like I say, I don't know how I missed this. I've got a pretty good little metal detector, but um, for some reason I just missed this one. Um, I did bring a few logs in, uh, different from loading at the side of my sawmill, but um, somehow or another this one just slipped by me. But we're going to get it off there. And uh, What I eventually do here is I I'd called the customer, told him the situation. These are 18 foot six inch there's the metal that i hit it's a piece of bob wire you'll see another little section here in a second i believe there's two little pieces and they're right in the middle of the tree but i called the customer and this is right at four feet from the end so what we just did is just cut a quick little view of it but there were two small sections of it i just cut four feet off of it as you can see that it's shorter there now so instead of 18 foot material he got 14 foot and he was happy with that so uh, that let us get right back to work without just pulling that one out of the way. Um, but I definitely checked it again with the, I rolled it back off the mill and checked it on my um, uh, in feed section there just to make sure. Because I knew that I had missed something somewhere, so I wanted to make sure I was going to miss it again. <laughs> it was very frustrating. You know, and talking about some of the uh, air drying techniques that um, Shelter Institute has in these videos that uh, I had watched. Um, very interesting. Some of the old school methods that uh, people used to do years ago and what it's become today. And, you know, a lot of people don't know of even why kiln dried lumber came into existence I mean it was not there back in the day you know um, back when wood was wood uh, old log cabins last couple hundred years these conventional homes today eh, you're lucky if you get that but uh, you're lucky to get a hundred but anyway um, you know they didn't think about the kiln dried stuff and my understanding from watching several documentaries is that it was actually started due to the big housing boom after World War II. That freight companies wanted to be able to haul more pieces with less weight. And that's where this all came into existence. So they trimmed the board down to what would be the minimum requirement. And by kiln drying it, obviously it was... A lot lighter so they fit the dimensions of railroad cars uh, tractor trailers more evenly and obviously less weight due to less moisture content but um, you know it does make the wood more stable obviously for thinner material as you're doing cabinets or whatever um, you know it's I don't know, it's probably been one of those things that um, is more, a, I think, a price increase than maybe what you're getting for it, actually. But, you know, it, it does stabilize the wood and gives you something that you can work with immediately. And that's the big factor with it. It's just a board you can pick up and go with and not have to worry about the instability or the cracking on the ends or the moisture level at all. And it's my understanding that, you know, the wood only changes dimensionally. Well, not only. It, it changes more dimensionally the uh, thickness and the width than it does in the length. So, you know, it just... I don't know, it's it's a matter of stabilizing the wood, I think, is the most important factor in it, to use it immediately.
But anyway, um, you can see here that um, I've got my little uh, ejection conveyor going. It's just a standard run for me. It's just what I do day in, day out. I mean, I never know what kind of trees I'm going to be cutting, what kind of material, or what kind of uh, boards that's needed by a customer. You know, this customer, they actually needed their bigger material first, so the 6x6s six and 8x8, eight so that they could go on and start with that. And they had bigger trees, so it really worked out well that we could cut what they needed to begin with out of the bigger trees that they had. But I tell you, they had some trees that were just... Matter of fact, he brought three trailer loads, about 15, 16 logs on each trailer load. The last trailer load, I just had to completely reject it because it was just terrible. You couldn't get anything out of it. I think on the whole trailer load, there were probably two good logs. And you, know, you hate to do that to people, but you know we discussed all these issues and what was needed what's, um, from the sizes of the material, finished lumber that he needed, what we could get out of those logs. And it just wasn't there. But you know these are things that you've got to discuss with people and you know your regular customer just doesn't know these things so it's, it's to your benefit to discuss with them on the phone to find out exactly what they're needing and the size of the logs um, and usually what I'll do when the conversation gets a little bit sketchy I'll say well I just need to look at the logs and we'll pretty much leave it at that so when I can finally put my eyes on the logs, obviously you know a little bit more about what you're going to be able to get out of it. Um, you know, you just have to kind of feel your way through it and talking with people. It's a matter of um, give and take as far as how much um, sway is in the tree, um, all the knots from limbs, whatever, you know, it's just going to give a lesser grade material and you have to go over that with the customer. You can see on this one I just pulled that little thin veneer off the top. I was going to um, do 8 by 8s out of it but because of the wane that was on there I decided to just go ahead cut that little bit off and just give the customer I think I'm going to do uh, 6 by 6s out of this. We're going to get this one out of the way and come back to it but um, just trying to get the most I can for the customer with the least amount of weighing on the material. He's going to be using this for a uh, post in a uh, barn that he's building, and he wants it to look you know, as good as he can. So we're just trying to do get the most that we can out of it um, as far as looks are involved. It's overall pretty good wood. That he had and all of it's just just been cut down so it's all very green but uh, overall other than the bob wire everything cut up real good i tell you i enjoy riding this ride along seat uh, it just makes things much easier and it, the fact of being right up there where the action's going on seeing the blade go through the tree, the log, you know, you can really keep an eye on things. I can just look over the edge and see if the um, blade guide arm is in the way, if it's going to hit anything. So you just, you know, you kind of right on top of things. It just makes me feel a little bit better about it, um, knowing where everything's at, and it's just right in front of you. I don't have my headphones on in this video. I don't know what I was doing. I normally have my Beats headphones going on, a little bluegrass music or something to get me going. And, uh, you know, the phone rings. They've got noise canceling uh, set up with them. I, I can actually answer a phone. I'll uh, sometimes stop the sawmill and walk out if there is some interference. But usually I can hear and the customer can hear as well. So it works out pretty good. You can see I'm swinging that out to just go ahead and get it off the sawmill. Then I'm going to come back and cut this other 
Kent down to, um, I think it was, uh, I can't remember. I'll know when I see it. But uh, as far as uh, Wayne that's on it, I'll trim off probably, I think it's a couple of two by twos off the top of this, and I'd probably give him two two by eights, I believe is what I'm going to wind up with that it's sitting on the loading arms there. Now, I appreciate all the viewers and subscribers that I've gotten over the past, I think I've been in this about three months. It really means a lot to me, all the comments and questions that I get. Um, so just keep them coming. If you've got questions about any of the modifications that I've done, feel free to leave a comment. and I'll be sure to get in touch with you. That's what makes all of it come together for me with these videos. You know, I spend the time in doing it. Um, I enjoy doing it. As long as it's helping somebody. Um, you know, life's all about lessons. There's no mistakes. A wise man told me once in life, there's only lessons. So I've had a lot of lessons myself. So <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you have as well. You can see that arrow is pointing to that um, attachment I made for the stump grapple there. It's such a, a piece of channel iron that comes down over those two points there. They um, don't mar the wood. And if I s swing that up, clamp it up, I can grab a, just a log, and it really gets a bite on the log. But this is a really good attachment for taking material off the sawmill or bringing logs into the sawmill. I can bring them in through the back door as well. And this skid steer will pick up a sizable log um, just like that and carry it straight away. Got a little bit of work I got to do to it. I've got some relief valves that are leaking a little bit on my bucket cylinders. I've got them ordered, as a matter of fact, today. You can see I'm going to edge these down to 2 by 8 and that'll get rid of the wane that was left on the top of those. That gives them a little bit better finished material. One of them was real bad, I thought, one on the left side. The other was not as quite as bad, but since I had the two there, I'm going to just go on and dress both of them off and just give them two good boards. And it probably took me, when I hit that barbed wire, it probably took closer to an hour to get everything back situated to get started and cutting again. Uh, it was a real pain in the neck. And any of you that's run into that, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you can't get the blade out of there, I have had to get my side grinder and just cut the blade um, just to get it out of there, uh, make short work of it. Matter of fact, I keep a side grinder with a eighth inch cutting blade there at the sawmills just for that. So here I'll get rid of those two by twos and then take his two by eights right on out to his stack that I've got him going out in the yard. And that's another benefit of taking the material out with that stump grapple. It grabs and keeps a real nice even bundle as you grab it off the sawmill and take it out to stack it so you don't have to mess with things too much. Um, it's just a real good attachment. And it really does a good job in clearing land. Uh, that's actually what it was designed and made for. Um, you just, the serrated edges on it, you dig down into the dirt beside the trees and lift up and drive backwards and those teeth are in reverse so they cut the roots. And having a good heavy skid steer, it really digs down in there. I've had some trees that had a lot of, you can see I'm checking a, another tree. I had to actually had to bring this tree in to try and help him get enough of, I think it's eight by eights. It's what I'm going to try and make out of this one. You can see the limbs on it and it's got a little sway to it. So I'm going to try and get what I can out of it. I think I might get, uh, I didn't mark the end. It doesn't look like I don't see anything on it, but I think I won't get him a, Either two six by sixes or two eight by eights. I can't remember exactly. But, 
Um, but then again, you know, in talking about working with customers, you know, most people don't know all the details in saw milling. They're calling. They they need to learn themselves. But you know, you got to kind of get to the heart of the matter and find out what they got. And it's usually best to just uh, tell them, you know, I, I need to really look at the trees. And a lot of times I've gone out to customers' property and looked at the trees and told them what they've got, what to expect. Uh, and it helps them out. And, you know, they appreciate that. And it only takes a few minutes of your time. Uh, but it, you know, can cut to the chase with everything so you'll know exactly what they want to get out of it and um, actually what they've got in trees because sometimes can be a, a big difference in the two and you can see I'm going to cut this limb off the top here first just to get it out of the way and I'll come back and work a little bit more on the uh, sway that's in the log but um, this limb had been stuck down in the mud so I didn't want to just grab my chainsaw and go over it so I got the uh, debarker going there and cut well below it so I didn't really dull my chain or bandsaw blade with it so I thought I'd just get this out of the way and then roll it up and then get that um, sway out of it on the next pass I normally like to flip them 180 degrees, but in this situation, I thought this would be best just to get rid of the trash and then work on that sway. Some of you know you go cutting into trees that's been stuck down in the mud or whatever, it'll dull your chainsaw blade in just a matter of seconds. That's a nasty looking flitch. That ejection conveyor has really helped out having those forks sitting there. My skid steer has actually got a quick attach button on the console so I can just flip a switch and it detaches whatever you've got hooked to it. Obviously if you've got hydraulic lines you've got to step out detach those but you know just once you get the, say the stump grapple off you're just walking right up to the pallet forks there and hooking to those push the button and it locks right to them now you can see that sway that's in this now I mean, it's a good bit but you know I'm just trying to get him what I can out of his the logs that he had um, and it may even just be one eight by eight it might even be one six by six I don't remember but it's not a lot to that log but you know it's gonna help him and uh, I believe, now that I think back on it, this is the one that, uh, it was an 8x8 that I get out of it, and when I made the last cut, I didn't realize it, but the um, far end of the log had raised up like 3 8 of an inch, so I've got an 8 inch by 8 inch on one end, and an 8 by 7 and 5 8 on the other. I marked it with a lumber crayon, so I'll tell him about it. And that's just what you run into with it. Um, so I'm going to get this nastiness cut off and then uh, get what I can out of it anyway. Uh, getting his 8 by 8s that was his most important thing that he wanted. So I kind of focused on those first and what I could get out of the logs that he had. And then went to 6 by 6s Just whatever the logs that I brought in, whatever I could get out of them, that's what I did. Uh, it really helps to, uh, while you're checking for metal, if you do, go on and, uh, if you know what your customers need, and go on and just measure the log and write on the end that's facing you what you're going to get out of it. That way, when you roll it up from the deck and raise it up on the sawmill, you already know what you're going to get. And on several of them, I had six by sixes with, uh, two by sixes so I knew that I was going to get a two by and then I would be down to the 
six inch by six inch on the log. It just makes it quicker when you're there at the sawmill uh, sizing things up. As you roll a log up, you already know what you're going to get out of the log. Anything along those lines you can do to help yourself. Uh, instead of stopping while it's on your mill, you stop, and get the tape measure out, measure it, and think about it, whatever, you know, while you've got the uh, metal detector going and tape measure on your hip, you know, just go on and uh, get that small diameter. And like I say, I automatically deduct four inches, and that tells me the limit of what I can get. And this guy, a lot of taper or sway in the tree, bow in it, you know you're going to probably get some wane on it if you're calling it too close. So if you've got, say, a 16-inch tree and you're wanting to get four or six by sixes out of it, you're going to push it on that. So it's best to have a little bit of cushion to keep from having so much wane in the finished material. Because, you know, you want to give your customer as best that you can get out of the log. A lot of time, on several of these, I had to just uh, bite the bullet and go on and cut a couple of two buys out of it and then uh, go for the lesser size, which was a six by six instead of the eight by eight. But that's the only way I could get out of heavy weighing on them. Several of them the finish boards had some wane. You can see what I'm talking about here with that laser light showing me how much wane is on this board. Then you look at the other side here, there's wane on this side as well. It kind of runs out as you get down three quarters of the way through it. But, you know, it's just what you run into with it. Um, and that laser really helps in doing that. You can kind of get an idea for what's going on. Um, because usually by having that small diameter facing to you, usually, obviously, you've got more meat on the bone there at the tail end of the machine. Usually your uh, wane is going to be more towards that smaller end, usually, unless there's some kind of sway, heavy sway, or kinks in the tree. All you saw millers out there know what I'm talking about, but for you new guys, um, you want to pay attention to it uh, to try and avoid as much of the bark inclusion as you can for finished material. You can see I'm just cutting a 2 by out of this, so that's going to probably give him a 16-foot good clean board in that 2 by 8 um, so it looks like that's what I'm going to give him. It's a 2 by 8 and an 8 by 8 on this run. It looks like this will be the finished cut on this particular log. You'll see when I make this cut, if that's the finished cut, I'll, how I swing that end out with the log clamp. Yeah, I think I do one in this video of um, 4 or 6 by 6s. I'll pull them on back, and I've done that several times, but this just works out easier for me. <clears throat> um, once you get the hang of it, you can just pick that log up and swing that tail end out. It's out of the way. The skid steer can grab it. Then you just take it right on to the... No, I'm, I'm going to rotate these and cut them again. That's right. So he, I think we're getting uh, four or six by sixes. Yeah. This one I have to give a little persuasion with a sledgehammer. It was hanging on those back stops back there. Just a little tap. And that lowers them on down there. So I'm getting four or six by sixes out of this one is what I'm getting. Um, this may be the one. I believe it is that I'll uh, put a strap around it and just ease it right on back out of the off the sawmill with the roll of tow boards up onto the takeoff conveyor. But in doing that, you know, when you make your finished cut, you're down at the tail end of the sawmill, so you've got to come back just to get your hydraulics to work. 
so that you can raise the roll of tow boards and I always put a strap around uh, any four out situation so they don't just in case so they don't fall off and make a mess but um, that's another reason that I just swing the bundles out uh, and just grab them with the skid steer it just makes it easier for me I'm used to it and it keeps my skid steer back at the back of the sawmill where I like to have it for moving logs in and out. And this is just my setup, just what I do. Everybody's setup is different. Everybody's got different equipment, uh, different techniques about things, and uh, different approaches. But, you know, it's all a matter of making it easy on yourself and your sawmill. Uh, you don't have to be the fastest in the land if you're efficient and simple enough so that you don't hurt yourself or your sawmill, you know, if you do too much extra curricular work, I guess. But I want to say again that uh, watching the Shelter Institute videos is a really good educational series of videos. They've got a lot of different videos out there and every one of them that I watch I've probably seen four or five Mr. Hennon he really knows what he's talking about he's old school he's been doing it 40 or 50 years timber framing and he really knows what he's talking about and he goes into pretty good detail about things I think that'll help a lot of sawmillers out there and getting a good understanding of uh, how to air dry your wood and the purposes of kiln drying, how to go about that, differences in timber frame and conventional. Obviously, we, we all know the differences in it, but uh, he goes more into detail about it. Uh, and I found it all to be very interesting. Yeah, so this one I'm going to go ahead and back drag it out of there. But you can see what I'm having to do. I had to come back to the operator end. Then I have to go all the way down, drop that drawback arm. I've got the roll of tow boards up now. Whereas I could have just swung it out when I came back and get off the sawmill and go grab it and I'm out the door. Um, so it just worked out easier for me in doing that. So I roll them out on that conveyor there and then grab them with precious and take it to the stack out there. Normally, I would have that strap I'm taking off. I would have it on this end. Um, that way, when I pick it up with the skid steer, the ends don't go awry. You'll see that happen here in just a minute. Um, they're just, they scissor more or less when you grab them with that uh, grapple attachment. Um, I don't think I went completely up on them. No, it looks like I did because I was pushing it forward. But you'll see how they kind of scissor a little bit. Differences in them. If I'd have had a strap around this end, they would have stayed together. It's no big deal. But normally what I would do is put it around that. It would have been the tail end of the sawmill anyway. But old Precious of Gravity. These are 18.6. So that's four six by sixes. 18.6 long. That stump grapple, it really handles well. You wouldn't think about it grabbing it from the end like this, but it's really a good attachment. Uh, it'll You can get tractor. Uh, these will fit on the regular Bobcat quick attach ends that you see on regular tractors. You know, you have to have a sizable tractor. This skid steer being a track loader, really makes a big difference. It doesn't sway near as much or bow down in the front when you pick up a load like that because you've got that cantilever effect going on there. It's really putting a lot of weight towards the front of the machine. So you've got the puppies running around out there. Bella and Brutus, they're the sawmill twins. They enjoy playing in the mud out there. We've had a lot of rainy spells. You can see Bella there with that mud on her hip. 
she doesn't mind. She's pretty tough. She just goes after it. Whatever it is, she's in there after it. Brutus, he's a little bit jealous. He just wants to get around the sawmill, but if I pet her a little bit too much, he wants to stand in between. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. I enjoyed talking about everything. Uh, if you've got any questions, as, as always, feel free to leave a comment. I would appreciate you thinking about hitting the like button and possibly subscribing. Got a lot more videos coming up. So just keep that in mind. Uh, hit that notification bell. When they do come out, you'll know about it. So until the next video, you guys take care. Be safe. We'll see you next time. Thank you.